So let's see if our uh, panelist is ready here. Uh, Steve, are you on the mic here with us? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Do you want me to flip the screen over here? Sure, yeah. Why not? So Matt, All right. Um, I look like – go Nova. Go Nova. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. All right. Steve, you should be the presenter here in a quick second. Uh, looks like we've sure. got a lot of webcams on here as well. Everybody's looking sharp dressed this morning. <laughs> well, none of the cameras have broken, so we've got we've all got that going for us, right? <laughs> That's a good thing. Hey, Matt. Well, thanks a lot for uh, for putting this together. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a topic that you know everybody's interested in, right? It's how can we get more business? Um, and you know, I I look at this concept of generating leads through through automation through through kind of two channels. One is internally, right? At Prospect Now, we sell a, a SaaS product, right? Where, um, you know, we're reaching out to commercial real estate brokers, so we have to consume this kind of technology. Um, and then at the same time, we're providing a lead gen product um, at Prospect Now to the commercial real estate community. Um, so one thing that's kind of uh, near and dear to my heart right now is. Um, lead scoring and figuring out which leads um, you should be calling on. Um, Matt, are you familiar at all with with predictive analytics or or, or lead scoring? Do you guys use any technology like that um, internally? At yeah. Least to, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm familiar with lead scoring and everything like that uh, for inbound marketing, but I've never heard anything for that in the way of properties or any uh, anything else. So a lot of David data driven stuff is based upon lead scoring or scoring systems, but nothing for properties. Yeah. So maybe I, maybe what I can do is talk a little bit about um, kind of the uh, I guess the iterations of, of the problems we've been trying to solve, um, and then kind of walk the the audience through kind of the next iteration of. Uh, you know, you start in the beginning, maybe I'll, I'll back it up and take it this way. So, um, you know, I was a commercial real estate broker, right, for a number of years. And, um, and my, my goal, I was focused mostly on investment sales, right? And, and my mission was to find people that wanted to sell, right? So I'm sure there's a lot of folks on the call that uh, have, have experienced that problem. And initially, my first kind of my first objective was just to be able to contact people that wanted to, uh, that, that owned property, right? And, you know, what I found was it was difficult to contact uh, folks because they own properties in LLCs and all these different structures. And I'm sure a lot of folks on the call have experienced that. So, um, so you know, the first thing was just to get the data, right? And, um, you know, Prospect now uh, is, a, is a data tool, right? And so we collect information and we can get through an LLC and figure out who, who owns the property and how to contact them and how to, you know, what to get their phone number and their email and all this stuff. But then about 18 months ago, this, this is the kind of data driven piece um, that, that we've, we started getting interested in. And that was, it's one thing to have a collection of leads. Um, or a collection of building owners or whatever. But the reality is what we really want to do is we want to spend less time prospecting. Um, and we want to spend more time focusing on folks that actually, in, in my case, as a real estate broker, it was, I wanted to talk to people that wanted to sell, right? And so, you know, over the last five years, I, I think five years ago, this kind of technology was really difficult to do because there wasn't enough data out there, right? But now data is everywhere, right? We hear this term all the time, this big data, this concept of big data and all of this. And um, there's so much data now that figuring out um, who to call on is, instead of guessing, we can actually use data science to figure it out. So this, this for me, this is like really exciting stuff, right? So for, so for example, you know, there's a lot of, things that intuitively we as real estate brokers kind of know that might prompt somebody to sell, right? So intuitively, we know that if a property um, has a five-year balloon payment on it, right, um, it's likely that that building owner, when they're 12 months out, they're either going to refinance, they're going to sell, 
or they're going to come in with cash, right? Or they're going to go into default. And um, because of those, we kind of assume, all right, well, this increases the probability that they're going to sell. But what's interesting about that is that's kind of an intuitive thing and it's based on logic. But if we look at enough data points coming in, we can actually start to, instead of guess, we can use data to tell us who we should be talking to. Um, and so that's one of the things that we've been focusing on over the last couple of years. And uh, in January, we actually launched this predictive um, marketing platform. And so kind of the way, the way I look at it um, is, you know, before, if you look at a given market, you might say that, you know, let's say you've got, I don't know, a thousand properties. Typically, there's going to be a percentage of those that are going to change hands in a given year, right? Um, and, uh, you know, what we found is that that ranges, but it's like right around two and a half to 5% of the properties, commercial properties in a given market will sell. And so, you know, what can we do to increase those odds? And so we started looking at all these data points and all these data feeds and started applying an algorithm to properties that have not sold based on the properties that have sold. Um, does that make sense? You guys following me? I got you, Steve. Go ahead. You have an, yeah. yeah, we're all following you. You have an awful quiet audience today. Alan is uh, relaxing in the back. Michael, you're pretty talkative. What's going on today, Michael? Just hanging out listening to some experts give me some good advice. <laughs> there you go. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't talking into the ether here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so, so then what we, what we found, though, is when you look at the data, right, so if you take, uh, on average, one out of 25 properties are going to sell, right, what we've done is we've looked at the, the properties that are selling and we say, let's tag the ones that have a higher probability. And so what we've been able to do is get that number down from one out of 25 to like one out of 15, right? So it's like a 68% jump. So this, this concept of predictive marketing is something, you know, I think on the real estate side is, is um, growing more and more, but also just across the board, we all want to call on people that are more likely to do business with us. And so the whole objective here is if you think about it, we're actually reducing, um, we're reducing spam, right? Because fewer people that don't want to sell aren't going to be getting, uh, you know, marketing communications, right? So why bother? For example, if somebody just put like a 30 year fixed rate loan on a property, it's not likely that they're going to want to sell. So why bother? spending the time with the marketing dollars. So this is something that, um, you know, we're really excited about. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, um, okay, well, how, how do you figure it out, right? Like, how do you figure out which properties are more likely to sell than others? And, and Alan and I talked a little bit about this when we were at the CRE Tech Intersect um, in LA. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, there's some, there's some key metrics that really um, relate to a property's probability of selling. Um, so, you know, what you want to avoid in these, in, in using data science is you want to avoid things that aren't correlated. So for example, you might be able to randomly see that, you know, properties in a given market for whatever reason sell more based on the phase of the moon, right? But we know that that actually has no relationship whatsoever, right? Intuitively. So that we know that would just be random. Um, but, if we can start to look at stuff that is repeatable and, um, and parameters that actually have an effect, then we can start to use these scoring algorithms to go and actually figure out, uh, you know, what is, uh, what, is, what is more likely to sell. So, you know, we're looking at all kinds, of, all kinds of fields, right? We look at the property holistically, right? But we look at things like holding period, how they own it, where they own it, the type of property, um, the debt on the property, all of these things, and um, and apply this this type of scoring. And it's really interesting to actually see, you know, what the results are because we built this little um, this is this is kind of fun. We built this little commission calculator where you know you can go in and say, all right, um, I'm actually going to share this with you because I think this is kind of interesting. Um, I'm going to log out here, and I'm just going to go to the the public facing prospect now website. And, um, you know, you can go in here and figure out, all right, given, take, based on your market, like what, how much money using predictive analytics could you save or make, right? 
Um, and so, you know, this one I think is, is pretty cool. So if I'm going to go in here, I'm a real estate broker and I work in, um, you know, Los Angeles, for example. Um, and it's going to say, okay, choose the property type. So I'm going to say I'm a commercial guy. Um, and it asks me like what I spend on direct marketing. Okay. So let's say I spend $12,000 a year, right. On direct marketing. So that would be mail, email. If you even wanted to put like calls in there, you could do that. And say I get, you know, 10 listings a year from that. And my average listing price is a million bucks. Okay. Just, just to put some numbers in there. Um, so what, what I can do is look at what does using predictive marketing do for me versus the status quo, right? So super fun stuff, right? Now, granted, there's a lot of qualifiers here, right? This isn't just automatic, but if you look at in LA, the turnover is 5.7%, you know, naturally, and it's 9% when you focus on the scored properties. So lots of opportunity there. Um, you know, you can say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to reduce my marketing spend, right? Um, so I could drop my marketing spend down 4,300 bucks. Um, or I could keep the marketing spend the same and I can go out and just get more listings. So this is the kind of stuff we've been working on. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that obviously we're pretty excited about. I think just in general, predictive marketing, um, we're going to see a lot more of this um, in, in tools we consume just in terms of, of leads, right? So, Matt, I'm sure you guys get a bunch of leads through your website, you know, every um, every month. And some of them, like, I'll give you an example in our case, like some of them, you know, some guy's just signing up for prospect now because he wants to, his, his neighbor's dog is barking too loud and he wants to, you know, call his neighbor and say, hey, you know, calm your dog down. And obviously that's not a lead for us, right? So we're all we're building this stuff internally also, which enables people to um, figure out, okay, is this a lead for us or is it not? So it's a general concept um, that, you know, is, is going to be continued to be applied across the board. So, um, you know, how, how do you, Matt, Matt, how do you guys figure out who to call on? Like when you guys get leads, you know, um, internally? Well, yeah, there's a, there's a definite, um, you know, data analysis, uh, utilizing this. And, and I think it's really interesting to see this, you know, brought out into, into properties. And I remember working with Steve, uh, probably five, six years ago on a proposed to close webinar with, uh, you know, with a bunch of other people on there and seeing the, the product and how to get to the emails and how to get to the numbers to do lead generation. And it's awesome to be able to see uh, the, the predictive analytics come into play and some of this automation portions in there. Uh, and then also ways that we can work smarter and not as hard. Uh, so I'm really excited to kind of see how those things are taken to play, uh, not only in, in social media marketing or email marketing, but now they're coming into the commercial real estate realm so we're watching the technology really jump up on there. And that's some of the stuff that, um, that, that I'm really excited to be seeing about on here. Um, Alan, what did you think when you talked to Steve about some of this stuff? Oh, I thought it was brilliant. But he pays me to say that. So what else am I going to say? <laughs> yeah. That's no, I, you know, Alan, it's, we it's were... interesting. Uh, I, everyone in this webinar knows Duke Long. And if you don't, you should. Duke and I had coffee a couple of months ago, and he said one of the national trends was talking in terms of predictive analytics. And, you know, we've used predictive analytics, and we didn't even know it was predictive analytics in the way in which we track lease expirations. Because what I've told newbies in the business is if, if a company has a lease that's expiring within the next X amount of months, they have to make a real estate decision. Now, that real estate decision doesn't mean that they're going to move. That real estate decision may be renewing a lease. That real estate decision may be to not make a decision and to go month to month or what have you. But it could, in fact, portend a move. So if you look at uh, copy salespeople, if you look at uh, folks that, that sell Internet service, all of, the, all of them have started to look at predictive analytics in terms of how a company or an occupant might change the way in which they do things. So uh, it's no, without a doubt the wave. Yeah, you know what's interesting too, Alan, is that if you look on, even on Facebook, right, when you see the ads that are being served, it's the whole world is just getting more and more tailored to our own kind of personal preferences, right? Uh, right. And so I, I totally agree with you in a, like in a perfect world, what you want to be able to do when that lease is expiring is, is reach out to that, that um, tenant, 
right when he was in need of your service, right? And that, that if you think about all of the wasted effort around marketing to people that aren't going to do business with us, right? Um, it's, that is ultimately, that's the holy grail. And I think obviously it's a tall order, but it's really interesting stuff. Like I've noticed it, I notice it everywhere now that I'm aware of it. I notice all of the, the way ads are served to me through Google, et cetera. It's really cool stuff. Big Brother is definitely watching. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, I'd like to bring some other people in here to do some uh, talks about the lead generation and kind of what, what experiences they had and what's been working with them and, and stuff like that. And, 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 you know, if I pick on you and you don't want to talk, um, you know, just let me know and I'll grab somebody else. I know we have Rod on here. We have Andrew. Uh, we have Michael and we have Josh. We'd love, love to hear some stories about uh, maybe how, how each and every one of you are, are doing some lead generation or – you know, and, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit later on is, is what do we do when we generate some of those leads and how can we convert those leads from one lead into 10 leads and then keep on getting that, that, that multiplying factor going? Because once you generate that one lead, let's, let's cultivate them and turn them into 10 leads, 20 leads, 100 leads, uh, and make sure we're maximizing our leads. So, um, hey, again, Matt. this is kind of a free-for-all, free so speak up, Alan, yeah. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a very important question for Michael Bull. Could I just – just a side note here. So, Michael, what's the weather look like for Augusta this weekend? <laughs> Plenty of pollen. <laughs> Plenty of pollen. It's going to be nice. Nice. All right. Was I using predictive analytics? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> this, is, you know, this is a week like no other. You know, Matt, awesome. Awesome. Well, Matt, let me, t let me take you up on a couple of things. I'm going to get away from predictive analytics. I, I absolutely believe in predictive analytics, but – for majority of lead generation, it still is, once you get the data, what do you do with it, right? How do you generate those leads? If we all sit back and wait for people to hit our website, that's gonna be a pretty long year and pretty low production year. Yeah. So one thing that, you know, obviously we're, I run a coaching company, but when, from that end standpoint, we look at all our coaches across North America and we look at their clients and we preach to them how to generate leads and what we're finding to be the most effective in that standpoint, uh, that, that standpoint is, you know, at the Mossimo Group, I'm not going to share too much of this with you, but here's a here's a whole book on here's a whole book on uh, lead generation and, and from our perspective, how we generate leads and the campaign. So we do this with our clients, and I'll, I'll share something quickly with you. When you look at a, a lead generation, I want you to think beyond the phone call, think beyond the meeting, think beyond the the marketing materials, the, the email blasts, the, the whatever presence initiatives you're doing, you got to put it all into a campaign to generate a lead. It has to be that way because it's not just one thing that's going to create the lead. I mean, yeah, sure. Calling someone at the right time, at the right moment when it's on their mind to lease, to sell, whatever, you might get some folks. But generally, to generate the greatest, highest quality leads, you need, you need a campaign. So I would suggest that to the folks out there, the scores of folks listening in today and those, those hundreds that will listen for the recording over the next several months, think to yourself in regards to campaign versus activity. So from a campaign, that's right, which makes any sense. If you look at this, this is a series of phone calls and emails and to-dos and tasks that is a campaign for prospecting for particular clients. That's a campaign. I want you to think in terms of what do I need to do, and Matt, you just alluded to it, you know, to get them interested, to show that I'm, I have value, to show that, in fact, I'm trustworthy, to show that, show that I'm sharing information, you know, that's sharing, it's caring approach, not selling, and ultimately, to have them speak up or take my call or meet with me, and once that happens, once they agree to that, what follows, whether it be a series of physical pieces or digital pieces or personal initiatives, you know, testimonials, what follows on that way till they find say, yes, I want you to represent me, be my advocate, be my advisor in my real estate needs, right? So beyond the, the analytics, I think are vital. Uh, I love what Steve's doing, but once you get those folks, those hooks, you gotta create a campaign to get them to know you like you trust you and ultimately decide that you will be my my uh, my advocate in my real estate needs. So that's what we look at is campaigns versus activities. Yeah, yeah it's I great totally to hear all these, that, Rod. That's a great these topics. 
Well, yeah, yeah you, ahead, Steve. Matt. I mean, with with Rod's Rod's topics and then your topics kind of blend in, and I think you'll start seeing Andrew's topics and my topics. And that's one of the things that I mentioned to some of the panelists that were on before is. You know, right. you don't want to just do one thing for lead generation. You want to tie you them all, all into a campaign. Right. Yeah, yeah and exactly. All of it into and a there's campaign. no one trick. There's no, like, that's the thing I've noticed in business, too, is that there's always, like, that desire for that one magic answer, right? And there's no substitute, right, for, for, for hard work, disciplined, you know, and, um, and effort and a good plan, which, right, which Rod, which would – fit into a campaign, right? A campaign being almost like a, like a plan with a series of actions and follow-ups. Is that, is it, how, how do you define a, a, a campaign, uh, Rod? Is, what, what are the containers or what's contained in that? Well, certainly you got to look at what the target audience are going after. That's number one, the message, the value proposition for that targeted audience. So uh, we call it the P factor. You have the prospect, you have the value proposition, then you have the prospecting initiatives to go after them. And you have the presence initiatives to review that that prospecting and support that prospecting. And ultimately, you're going to get the pitch, right? More P's. And then hopefully the production, the performance, and the profit. So I think you in those in those terms, that's to me, all that goes into an integrated campaign versus, hey, make 100 calls today. Okay, good luck with that. It, it, it will work, but not as effective. I, I, I totally agree, one hundred percent. Hey, Max, are you on the are you on the call here with us, Max? Can you chime yeah, in I'll, on some I'll of this stuff? It. I'd love to yeah. hear love to hear you talk about campaigns because you are you are probably my social media idol. Sorry about that. Well, I was I got an email this morning that I was supposed to be on this call, but I think it was just from from last month, so I hopped on anyway. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll throw a a real world example of what a campaign would look like just for for Steve for Prospect now because I look at your website. So, I would do a uh, I would set a retargeting campaign that puts a Facebook pixel on that calculator site, I would use that calculator module because it's really interesting and cool to target specific local regions of real estate brokers with a really unique ad that says, hey, check out this really cool ROI calculator, make smarter decisions today. I would drive them to the site, then I would pixel those people, put them into a custom audience on Facebook that they would then get hit with a lead gen ad on Facebook that offers them maybe a white paper uh, 10 ways to make more money with your, your transactions this year or, or something that fits with what prospect now is doing. I would then put those emails into whether you're using Infusionsoft or MailChimp or Consult Contact or whatever your email provider is. And I'd have a, an automated workflow there that would contain various emails that provide knowledge with a mix of call to action. So it could be white papers, it could be tips, it could be videos. Then based on that, um, you know, the cool thing is uh, I'm using Infusionsoft right now for, uh, for Kevin Harrington, who was the first shark on Shark Tank, and uh, we're vetting leads throughout the process based on how people were responding to contact forms. Um, so based on what your objective is, based on whether you need capital or looking for capital, based on how much sales you've had in the last two years, I'm tagging that lead as a prime or subprime lead. And then based on whether they're prime or subprime, they're getting put into a different funnel. Because somebody that needs capital over somebody that has capital is a very different prospect to me. So if I'm Kevin Harrington and I'm a member of Shark Tank, I'm getting pitched 100 times, 1,000 times a day. I know a lot of people don't have any money. They can't afford my speaking fees. They can't afford me to come to their event. Um, but they might be able to buy some of my membership site stuff. They might be able to, uh, to buy an ebook or my last book or whatever it may be. They might be able to buy low ticket items. And so you know, building out these workflows really involves a, a mix of using inbound lead stuff. So using lead magnets, whether that's a free ebook, whether that's a webinar, whether that's a cool tool like the ROI calculator, then it involves having the ability to tag and segment people. And that can be done through uh, Facebook pixels, which I know that's, it can be a scary thing. Um, uh, installing pixels on my site and how to set it up. Uh, it's pretty basic. There's a ton of resources out there of how to install them on your site. And that's the reason most of you, when you go on Facebook and you think it's serendipitous that Facebook's reading your mind. And I was just right, looking at that right. last week. It, it's not magic. It's not serendipity. It's, uh, yeah. you know, that, that person's website had a pixel on it. You went there and they're running an ad that's just targeting people that went to their site. Um, so that's just retargeting one-on-one and, uh, yeah. and having that, that workflow built out. And that's the beauty of, you know, the stuff I focus on right now is 
how can I work less and make more? And so it's not about like working hard, it's about working smarter. So if I'm going to build out, and Rod, I saw him that he has a nice, nice workflow built out for clients. The beauty of that is if you put the time in and you, you know what you're doing and you put the resources into the funnel, that can run itself for the most part. Obviously, it's going to need tweaks. It's going to need to be edited and maintained and, and monitored. But if you're a big brand, you don't have time to, to hold each lead's hand especially if you're getting a lot of inbound leads. So you need to be able to vet leads in an automated fashion. You need to be able to put those leads into a separate funnel so you can still monetize them just because they're not high quality leads doesn't mean you can't make money off them. And then you need to put the high quality leads at the top and then the, the most pressing leads that might require a phone call or some personal touch, they can go to a task that then can be automated and sent to one of your sales guys. And so a lot of that stuff can be done if you're using Infusionsoft, it's an awesome tool. Uh, even content conduct and MailChimp have ways to to segment people. I mean, it's not the as powerful or advanced, but all email providers have the ability to build out these automated workflows and set up triggers and segments. Um, so I, I know that probably just <laughs> was ten minutes of, of confusing jargon, but um, you know, feel hey, free to Max, ask I actually, questions. I have a question for you, Max, on um, on the retargeting stuff. Yeah, maybe 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 a bit tactical, but. Um, you know, we we noticed that Google AdWords has some some retargeting capa capability, um, and you know we've 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 messed around with some of the other um, remarketing tools out there, and I'm just kind of curious which which ones you like the best, uh, and and what what do you think you know is the most effective? Because because I look at everything on cost per lead, right? Yeah. And so I I have my channels and I can measure that. And, you know, for example, like the Google AdWords display network versus the, just the direct search network, we get a much lower cost per lead on the search network than the display network. So, you know, figuring out how to, how to reduce that cost per lead, you know, retarget is something, uh, retargeting is something I'm, I'm actually really, really interested in, but I haven't kind of found that secret sauce on, on how to leverage that as, as efficiently as, as possible. I'm just curious what your, your thoughts are there. Yeah, so th there's hundreds of tools out there that do retargeting for you. I think the most common and popular is called AdRoll. Um, it, it's a great piece of software. I, I do. I just use everything through Power Editor on Facebook um, because they have a really robust platform for for hardcore advertisers. A lot of people don't like it because it's not very pretty or polished like Ad Manager, but it has everything. So anything I need to do, I can scale out 35 A/B testing ads under two different ad sets in 10 minutes and um and so i think the you know going back to what you said about cost per lead i think the the other thing specifically focused not just on you know, retail and e-commerce but on real estate is not so much uh, people get hung up on click the rates and cost per clicks and metrics and the, the cost of the ad and they don't focus on the roi of the the ad right and so right, the focus exactly. needs to be on what the the long-term value of that that for the tenant selling the, the, the property or somebody that's refinancing or whatever it may be and, and understanding what the, the upside is there for closing that deal. Because the, the, the cost per lead could be anywhere from 99 cents to $150. And you, that, that doesn't mean anything unless there's a basis for what my return is on that. And so I think for the real estate industry, obviously the ROI is pretty significant. If I can just sell one property a year, I can spend thousands of dollars on my, my Facebook ads um, and it, it makes me money. If I'm selling t-shirts, that doesn't work in <laughs> my, my profits, $5 a shirt. And so it really depends on the industry. It depends on the product you're selling. So for real estate, I think the, the cost per lead can be a little higher because the, the upside there on the ROI is, is significantly higher. Yeah. Max, Max, and what I'm people are willing to pay for it. Let me ask you a question, Max, if I may. Some folks on this phone call today may be saying, that sounds great, but my clients aren't on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. They might be on LinkedIn, they're not on Facebook. I, I, I think I know the answer, but can you, can you address that? Sure. So, so I, get that, I get that like every day. And um, the beauty is that 1.5 billion people are on Facebook. Facebook powers tens of millions of sites, just like Google does, not on Facebook. So they have a thing called the audience network. And so there's millions of websites you visit on a daily basis with a lot of commercial real estate blogs and, and finance blogs and websites that are making money because they're using Facebook's ad network. And so I can still hit you with a retargeting ad, even if you never go into Facebook ever. 
just because you're going to be on a website that is industry relevant. So it's going to be a real estate based website or a finance based website, and you're going to be seeing the ad there anyway. And so uh, just because the person is not socializing on Facebook or using Facebook, they're still 99% of the time going to hit some type of Facebook property on a daily basis. And Google's the same way. Google, you know, they, they, between Google and Facebook, they're powering pretty much every ad based website on the internet right now. I could add to that too. Oh. Uh, this is Michael. I was on a um, panel for social media for commercial real estate and we had a packed room, biggest crowd we'd ever had at the Atlanta commercial board. And we talked about uh, different social media sites, uh, you know, all the, the big ones, Twitter and LinkedIn and, and Google plus at the time and, and uh, Facebook. And I was very surprised when I got back to my office that afternoon, uh, Facebook uh, lit up. I've never had so many contacts with so much visibility on Facebook. So, I thought, no, no, these these old guys uh, in real estate, they're not on Facebook. But this was a commercial real estate brokerage crowd, and apparently they are. And what I'm hearing from all this stuff is I'm hearing that, you know, not only do, do we have the ability to, to make those 100 phone calls like Rod mentioned, um, but we have the ability to start working really smart and starting adding some of this. And you, and you can take away a little bit. I mean, this is not something that you have to implement all of this. If you implemented a little bit of this, it's going to start helping build that relationship ahead of that phone call. So you have more information to build that relationship and maintain that relationship. And some of the stuff that I want to talk about is once we maintain that relationship, you know, what tools are we utilizing to, uh, to, to, to keep that relationship going? What tools are we utilizing to, um, or what tools are out there to, uh, to take that one lead and turn that one lead into to five or 10 different leads? And then how do we keep staying in front of them and be relevant? And I, and I think as everybody writes this stuff down, we have a tendency to get a little analysis paralysis. So I recommend everybody just write down, you know, one or two takeaways from this. And, and, and by no means are we done now, but, you know, as you listen to this, take away something that Alan's done or Michael's done or, or Max mentioned or Josh or Rod or Steve or myself has mentioned. And write down one thing and just start looking into it and, and see what you can do to add on to generate more leads. Um, because it's incredible how as you start building up the conversation, it becomes more fun. Um, your job becomes a lot more fun instead of me calling Michael and saying, hey, Michael, you want to buy a property? I really, Michael's a either calling me or I have more information on Michael and what Michael likes and what he's about and, and, and the right property for him. So that conversation with Michael now is a lot more fun. It's a lot more educated. And I have a lot more insight to what Michael's needs and wants are where I can really offer him a service instead of just giving him a hard, hard, cold pitch. So there's a lot of things that I'd say that you can kind of take away and start just writing some of these things down, um, you know, and in and, and some of the questions we're getting is how do we, you know, implement some of these these things. And I think uh, just starting out with one or two two sections, you can implement them. Um, and then, you know, Rod's always around, obviously, for for, for training and other expertise. And uh, we'd like to take some questions, I think, here in the audience. And then I'd like to talk about some other uh, alternatives uh, or additions to these marketing campaigns because what you are all are talking about kind of seems like on the front end, right? Um, you know, the inbound marketing, the analytics and stuff, and some of the stuff Rod mentioned. I want to talk about some of the, the back end stuff uh, that you can utilize to generate leads as well that I think people forget about. Well, I could share some things that, um, that we do. Um, you know, I think it's real important what was said already about defining your audience. And I think for people um, catching this webinar, it's, it may be a little different for almost everyone, you know, on the on the webinar. So I think once you define that, you know, reaching out to them and, you know, the the attraction marketing is something that we've used well. Uh, you know, I think we've gone from push to, to attraction and we use multiple things like Rod mentioned uh, for that attraction marketing. We do. Um, monthly e-newsletters for every sector and so that it's easy for the agents we, we do that for them what i used to do is tell agents hey you need to have an e-newsletter you need to have a print newsletter you need to do this and do that well really they want to make calls they want to be with clients and so we found if we can do it for them and make the numbers work uh, then it really happens and it's professional so we do a monthly e-newsletter for each specialty uh, that provides information for those people. And we put different things in there and we've tested to see what is it that those people want that they won't opt out of it. 
and, and we've found uh, market information, management tips, uh, financing news, um, sold comps, and um, uh, acquisition opportunities, and things like that are uh, interesting to different people. The other thing that we found for traction marketing is doing a, a quarterly print newsletter, which is interesting because I think people think that snail mail is gone. But one of the things that we found from it is that uh, because a lot of people aren't using snail mail, it can be very powerful. So we do a print newsletter, we do it very professionally, we do it for every sector. So the agents have that and it's personalized for them. So it's both of those are personal marketing for them, uh, but it's done. Um, the other thing that uh, I think is important is when, you, when you're making contacts is that, that with the predictive analysis um, analytics, that you're contacting people that you have a benefit for, that you have a tra potential opportunity or transaction and that you're not really cold calling them. Um, another thing that I've learned from Rod and some others is, you know, having a minimum. So if you're a broker and you've got to kill what you eat, you've identified who, who you're going to contact, you have a benefit for them. And then you have a minimum that you're doing every day so that it becomes part of your, your daily activity. Um, and I think that's a, a real big thing that I found uh, my brokers, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, they get busy doing deals, then they're not doing their, they're not filling the pipeline. But if they have a very small minimum each day that they're consistently doing, it's like exercising a little bit every day, they get it done and it, and it keeps their business uh, moving along. I think another thing quickly that I was asked to speak about on this webinar is actually speaking at events and, and how to do that and how to use that. And it has that been helpful. And, um, you know, it, it has been helpful. And, you know, I've come off of, of panels, moderating panels, being on panels, uh, speaking at events, you know, where people come up immediately and they want to do business. They want to do, they want to ask about the market. They have an opportunity. So I've come off of, off a of stage and had someone come up and enlist a large downtown property with me within a week. Um, so I think when you have opportunities that you have some expertise, uh, just like the general, all of us here are doing, and you share it with people, I really appreciate that you're providing the information and it can create leads. Michael, I have a question for you. So you mentioned newsletters. You know, how, how, how beneficial are the newsletters? Are they more of, a, you know, an education instead of a sales approach? Uh, are you actually generating leads off of that? Yes, we are, and they are educational. They're very educational, but we will include, uh, so on the investment sales um, brokers for their newsletter, they are specific to the property type, they're specific to the area, and they will include some type of like management article, uh, and then some an update on the market, and then they'll include some acquisition opportunities, um, they'll include some sold comps, and then as we talk to people, sometimes we find that, you know what, I don't need the rest of the stuff, you guys, but I like seeing the sold comps you send me. Um, so I think, you know, just testing it and seeing what your particular market uh, wants to know about is important and helpful. And yes, we have, have created leads with it. And also it's its presence that Rod likes to talk about, you know, so because you're really going to want to call on them if they're, you're very much your target audience and you're a commercial real estate broker that does large deals, you're going to really want to call them with an opportunity. So what you would hope is that when you do call them, they go, oh, yeah, Michael Bull, yeah, what, no, you, yeah I know you sell office buildings. Yes, I'd love to talk to you. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm good to hear really you. Fascinated by it. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. No, no, yeah, it's all I like you. To, I mean, like, it's, like I said, this, I, I is, this is all of us. We, we can all talk at the same time probably too. <laughs> I was going to say, Michael, it's, it's Steve here. Um, I, I, I'm really interested in that kind of hybrid online, offline um, approach uh you know because I, I think you're i think you're right that people just kind of dismiss the snail mail uh deal and you know it's just another channel right it may not be as sexy but it you know we found um that you know we have a lot of customers that that do a lot of direct mail and and uh and they do it in almost a hybrid way of trying to drive traffic to their sites and their blogs and stuff um and I was just wondering from, from your perspective, how do you, is, do you have a, a, a means to kind of measure the engagement from the snail mail through, you know, through your, your online uh, approach? No, I would say that I don't, to be honest. Um, 
you know, it, it's hard to measure that. You know, it, it's almost like uh, I think of it in terms of you're driving down the highway and you see a Coca-Cola sign. You know, they don't know that you bought a Coke, but it's keeping your name in front of them. And I think you very much have to be a proactive uh, in, in contacting people proactively in your specialty, in your area, uh, with an opportunity. So I think it's a little bit more about coming across as a professional. You know your market. Uh, you're not uh, here today, gone tomorrow. You st and uh, so when you contact them, they're just more open to you. Yeah. yeah I, I like to jump in here uh, just for a second. I've worked with a couple of people on this same kind of concepts where they have something that's traditional media, whether it's a postcard, a billboard, something like that. And the question comes up, how do I track the return on investments? How do I prove that this was worthwhile? And so there's been a couple of things that I've worked with people in the past uh, to track that. One of them is to have a, a tracking phone number. And you can get phone numbers very inexpensively, like, like maybe $30 a month for 10 different tracking numbers. And if you use that number in your email blasts, on your postcard, whatever, whenever someone calls that number, it forwards straight to your phone line, but you can track and see how many times it was called. And you can even track, you can record the calls if you want, want to, you can see where the call came from. There's a lot of metrics that you can look at just to see how beneficial was that postcard or email blast or whatever. So that's one thing from the phone call aspect but also from the online, did they visit my site? What you can do is you can create a page, like a, a URL, and make it so that they go, they visit. So um, if you have example.com is where you want them to go, but you give them the URL of example, uh, greatexample.com. When they hit great example, it automatically forwards them to example.com. They don't know the editor. They don't know that they got forwarded. But when you go to your website analytics, you can see you had X number of visitors that came from greatexample.com. And you can say, hey, I had this many people visited my site because they hit that URL that I made. And the only way they would have hit that URL is because they saw that URL on a billboard or a postcard. So that's a way that you can track both website visits and also phone calls from traditional media, which is uh, pretty cool to be able to say, hey, this is what your billboard did or something like that. That's a Thanks, great Mark. idea, and we, we should do more of that, and, and we should. One of the things that we do is really, uh, I think we're getting new school and old school here, is uh, any lead that comes in that calls our office, um, you know, our front desk is a real person that understands real estate and is very intelligent, and when they take the leads, uh, they all come to me to start with, and one of the questions from her is, you know, who referred you to us? And so we find out, you know, where, where they come from. And, you know, we find sometimes that, uh, you know, they'll say that, that we, can, they, we have more signs in our particular market than anyone else. So sometimes we'll find it's, it's because they've seen our signs or because they've known us, you know, forever. Uh, and, and, and what I suspect, though, is that it is, it is something in particular that, that hit them that reminded them of us. And we should bet we should track a little closer in, in some of those methods. Hey, Michael. Um, hey, Josh, this ties into what you and Michael were talking about. This is Andrew Bermudez over at Dixie. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing great. Good. I actually had to jump on the pull out my hotspot because I was on the phone call and uh, nobody was hearing me, actually. You know, one thing we have talked about and we're touching on right now is actually tracking what's being successful in these campaigns. Rod had mentioned about campaigns. So for those of you who don't know Digsy, Digsy is an on-demand tenant rep platform for businesses. So what we do is businesses looking for representation. We partner up with local brokers in certain market geographic areas, and then we vet them in, and then their performance is scored by the system. And the system will basically issue them more clients and larger clients uh, based on their performance. So one of the things is we have a dual sided marketplace. So we have to one prime, the pump on getting tenants and buyers on our website. And then two, we have to recruit uh, very talented agents in markets. So one of the things that we do is a lot of our leads come online from either Google, the search engine, Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera. And what we are very, very stubborn about is making sure that we have tracking links. 
And those tracking links, uh, they're really easy to set up. Actually, you can just say track URL on Google and it'll give you a page where you can just enter some data and it'll give you specific links. And when somebody clicks it, you're able to attribute that to a specific campaign or a specific keyword. So we have all that stuff feeding into Google Analytics and Google AdWords and then our master system, which tracks, you know, the phone calls and all that stuff. But then what's important is to have those unique tracking URLs. It's a really easy to build a site like what you were mentioning, Josh, um, as uh, a, a landing page per se, where they land to a specific URL. You can do that on unbounce.com. So U-N-B-O-U-N-C-E.com relatively inexpensive and you can do it just manually if you have no technical knowledge you're able to create that url to use a url that forwards to that based from google and uh, the google tool that i was mentioning but we track every week on tuesday or on thursday uh, wednesdays we meet and we go over all our channels and the ones that consistently perform the best we double down on so it's very important to know what's actually working what keywords are working what campaigns are working because it doesn't have to be a keyword it could be just an add on Facebook or LinkedIn, et cetera. And then you're able to say, oh, you know what? This seems to work very well, but I'm not giving it enough money. Let me throw some money at it. But on your dashboard, you're able to see, okay, is my social media links working? Is it my retargeting uh, ads that are working, uh, that are working on my marketing, et cetera. And I would say that landing pages for specific messaging. So if you're targeting, you know, uh, investment sellers, uh, who want to do buy 1031 properties, just a page, just, you know, targeted at 1031s. Um, that's very, very important. We've noticed that when we just have a blanket message that it doesn't perform nearly as well as when you're really, really niche in a specific message. Right. Yeah. Good I'll, stuff, I'll, good I'll, stuff, I'll second that. Uh, I, I think it's the, that's like the most common thing that I see is, is when I work with clients that they're terrified to double down on things and increase their budget on campaigns that are working. And it, it, what's interesting is that the, you can run the exact same ad with the exact same copy, creative targeting, and it could perform totally different in December as it can in March. And so I, it, it happens all the time where I see a client, they'll have a bunch of ads running and one is making a ton of money and they're spending the exact same amount of money across the board and they wait and wait and they keep spending five dollars ten dollars a day and then eventually the performance just starts to to drop for there's dozens of reasons why uh, things change over time but uh, definitely if you find something that's working it's making you money and it's been making money for a, a little period of time you need to to ramp that up and you need to be able to cut things that aren't working and uh, that's probably one of the biggest pieces of advice you can take away from you if you're spending money on paid advertising is you look at the data and listen to it the other thing that ties into that that most people don't know, Max, is so Google looks, the search engines look at you at how much you spend and how likely they want people to click on your ad. So if an ad's performing well, but you're not giving it enough gas, it's going to give, even somebody's not performing as well, it's going to give that person priority over your ads. Yep. So it's going, you're actually doing yourself a disservice by telling Google, hey, you know what? Yeah, but I don't want to spend that much. So why don't you let the guy behind me who doesn't have a service in front of line. Yeah, I mean, they're businesses. Facebook and Google want you to spend more money. They, they make money by you spending more money. So if they have two advertisers and one's spending a lot more than you, they're gonna to try to make the one spending a lot more than you very happy. And that means they're gonna give them better bidding, better pricing, better placement. Even if they have a lesser you know, the, product. The other, thing, the other thing on that, uh, Andrew, that I think is, is, um, is we've noticed repeatedly is that the the better our click through rate is, and in other words, the more relevant the ad is as it relates to the search term, the lower the cost per click, right? Because they also they're balancing that. They don't want you know you to search for you know Porsches and um, Volkswagen comes up. You know what I'm saying? They it 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 kind of devalues the the, the clarity of the search engine, right? So um, so I, I've seen that too. That they are you know to Max's point. They, I mean, they are so smart about figuring out how to, how to just make it logical, right? For you to spend yeah. as much money as possible. It's crazy. Yeah. And it's, it's a quality score for Google and for Facebook. It's called the relevance score. So those are the two scores yeah. they use to determine your pricing and placement. And if you have a relevance score on Facebook below six or five, they're probably not even going to display your ad uh, because it doesn't help anybody on the platform. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
So, so guys, I, I kind of want to try to wrap some of this stuff up, and I, I wanted to touch base just on a few things, and I don't want to take up too much time, but I know we've been talking about a lot of lead generation uh, and, and front-end lead generation, and I wanted to kind of bring up a couple tools that, that we've seen work for, for our clients, and we have you know clients now in over 37 countries, and it's working for all of them out there, and I wanted to bring up a couple of things on that, and I also wanted to touch base and kind of leave this with everybody there, um, you know, the different ways that you can utilize uh, once you generate that lead with Max or Josh or Michaels uh, or Steve or Andrews or Rod's sets, you know, what, what do we go ahead and do with those? And I invite you all to come to our, uh, our site at realnext.com and take a look at ways that you can go and, and manage those leads once you have those leads driven. And I'd like to recap, uh, you know, just some of the other tools that are out there to help you once you have those listings. And, and one of them was our, our e-marketing campaigns. Uh, not, what, what a lot of people don't understand is when they come to us, they say, you know, I'm using uh, a program like, you know, Constant Contact or MailChimp or these other ones that are out there, but, you know, I don't have a lot of clients. I have three or 400 clients. I'm getting started in brokerage. What can I do? Um, we have some really awesome email marketing stuff uh, that will allow you to email up to 200,000 uh give or take users uh, in segmented areas. So these are other things that you can start utilizing if you don't have a lot of uh, leads or a lot of business and you don't have the ability to do the Google and everything else, you can check out our email marketing campaign programs that we have through BuzzTarget and through Property Line. Uh, a couple other things I wanted to, to make sure that uh, people are aware of is once you go ahead and you, you utilize um, those tools that Max and, and Michael are talking about is, is getting something like um, like Steve was talking about with the data as well, something where you're having this data-driven leads uh, and you're pulling them in, make sure you have something that you can track and prospect out of. So, um, it, you know, for a lot of people that are out there, Excel and Outlook aren't the way to go. Um, take a look at something else, whether you use our product or something, we want you to use something to manage it. Uh, and if anybody's utilizing prospect now, uh, we have the ability to synchronize and bring their data into our CRM system. We also have a, a lot of other really cool um, micro websites and lead generating deal rooms, but I don't want to take over uh, the webinar. I just want to bring up that not only do we want to go ahead and we want to do the front end lead generation, but for that dollar that you spend or the $10 that Max is telling you to spend, uh, we want to make sure that we get the ultimate ROI. And the ultimate ROI is once we sell them one property, we want to learn how to sell them 10 more properties. And having something that's going to be able to track, follow up, and maintain them that business with them is going to be something that you're going to want to utilize. And, and that's why I kind of wanted to bring up uh, the other side of, of lead generation is don't think about that dollar that, that Michael spent on his ad as one person. Think of that as 10 possible sales because once Michael gets that key relationship, now it's maintaining it and taking that relationship to the next level and then expanding your market. Uh, and we're also finding out people are utilizing tools like we offer to gain leads. They say they'll put an ad up or, or record a video and say, hey, Michael, this is what we do. These are the tools we use. And they're generating leads that way as well. So don't spend all your money generating leads and then leaving the lead, lead hang there after you sell them one thing. Keep the relationship going. Uh, I yep. can say so many times people, uh, a broker will get a lot of contacts, which is great. It's great to have a lot of contacts. Um, but then they put them kind of like what you talked about, what Mike was talked about, putting them into a list and then emailing them, but they could do so much more if they were to separate all those contacts and say, hey, this contact is interested in office space leasing. This is interested in selling office space or buying office space and then retail and then re you know, break it all up. And then when you send your emails, you, you target that email specifically to the person, you know, a very rightful approach that way you send the right email to the right people and then you don't get them inundated with all these emails that are irrelevant to them and then they end up unsubscribing from you so that's kind of what you're talking about also you know you have the contact but once you get the contact what do you do with it put it where it needs to be take the time to properly label it and, and get the most out of it yeah and, and, and another thing to, to capitalize on that is, you know, look, if I go and I spend $100 per, per lead or $1,000 per lead, I, I want to be able to offer that lead something. And I think Michael touched base with his building value with your client. What can my client offer me? You know, can, can, do you have the ability to have electronic CAs done? Do you have the ability to track all my leads on a specific property? Do you have the ability to tell me how many people you can get my property in front of if I'm going to list with you? 
Um, so it's not only bringing that lead in there, it's also then building the value in your company. Michael has more signs than anybody else out there. Uh, he's better looking than anybody else out there. Uh, and, he, and he's got, you know, he's got a great firm, but he also have, has a core of products behind him that help him out with that uh, to, to help maintain it and build that value. Definitely. So I, I'll leave, I want to leave somebody with like a, a tip of a, a cool tool to use before everyone, everyone goes. So, um, you know, I think everybody on this call probably shares multiple articles per week on social media. And so it might be the Globe Street or one of the other dozens of, of influencer blogs or industry publications. Start using a tool called Snipply. It's S-N-I-P dot L-Y. What Snipply does, which is really cool and it's driven a ton of leads for me, is it at takes the link for the article and adds a layer on top of it for you. So when you go and you share that next article about uh, leasing rates at sky high rates or rent rates at, at record levels, um, in the bottom left of that article, when people go to Globe Street, it's gonna have a little bar that has a picture of you with a call to action and a link to your page. And it might say something like, you know, uh, let me help you find the best rates in Orlando or, or whatever the call to action might be. So it lets you actually brand third party websites and leverage that content that you're sharing to drive leads. And it's a totally free tool. Uh, you just gotta set it up and set some call to actions up. Uh, but definitely check it out. It's one of my favorite new tools to use. Uh, I use it when I'm sharing any type of, of article now um, because it helps you drive organic leads. And people don't know what, it, people get confused by it a little bit because they're like, why, you know, okay, this is, you're on Globestream and stuff. And it actually builds some authority and trust as well because people don't really understand the technology behind it. Um, so it's a great cool tool to check out if you're looking for a, uh, another way to drive organic leads. That's awesome. Thanks. So I'd like to take some time and I'd like to hear from the audience. Um, we have a lot of people on here and we have a lot of new faces, but a lot of familiar faces as well. I'd like to hear from, from each and every one of you. Well, actually, I guess we don't have enough time for that. But I'd like to hear from a couple of you. What have you done for lead generation? What has worked? Um, you know, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, hi hiring a, a sign, sign spinner to put out front of your building or, you know, you're doing some billboards or, or anything else. W what have you done that's worked for lead generation? Uh, you know, we like to have these CRE breakfast clubs so we can talk amongst ourselves uh, and our peers like we are doing now and get different perspectives on different things we're all doing. Uh, we're bringing great guests like Maxwell and Josh and Michael on here that have tremendous amount of experience and Steve and Andrew and Rod. But you all that are on the call, this is the reason why we do all this. So I'd love to hear from, from some of you of what you're doing and what, what lead generation tactics you can share with your peers as well um, and, and what's worked or, or what hasn't worked that you've tried uh, for, for generating leads because we all want to work, work smarter. Uh, and at the end of the day, we ought to all want to be able to to uh, to work together in a, in a great area. Um, you know, one of the things that we're going to be touching base on next month is we're going to be talking about conferences and clubs and and speakings. And you know, we're going to be out at SAOR uh, in April 13th, 14th, and 15th uh, in San Diego, and it's going to be an awesome event for us. So that's going to definitely be a lead generator for us. But but Dan, maybe you can tell us, or Emily, or or Howard, or Ken. Uh, or Sheldon, what has worked for you uh, for lead generation that you want to share? Um, it doesn't seem like a lot of people want to share their lead generation stories. It's proprietary. Michael's people on here sharing his. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I found the secret sauce and I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> yeah. But I but I think having having campaigns, uh, utilizing what, what other people are, are doing here. Um, here, I got one right here. Um, old school postcards have been working great for us lately. And, and, and it's really neat to see, um, you know, and, and you can kind of see it in different uh, realms, meaning like you see it in fashion come back. You see you know, with, with uh, the hipster coming back, bringing back, you see bell bottoms or whatever. Well, now you start to see snail mail and sign spinners, and we get to see all these different, um, you know, old school ways coming back. As we start seeing them in other industries, we start seeing them come back to our industry as well. Um, so I guess the, the tried and true sale process never ends. It's always evolving, though. Anybody else have anything they want to share, talk about, get off their chest, uh, confess, or anything? <laughs> well, you good. mentioned. Uh, Go ahead. I'm just saying it's good. All right, I got a couple here. I've been uh, beginning to send snail mail newsletters delivered from Leeds. 
um, uh, from Prospect Now. So, you know, I guess you can send some snail mail through Prospect Now as well. Steve, you should have mentioned that as we talk about snail mails. Um, but keep in mind, we have all kinds of cool stuff for you. There's a lot of people on here that have different tools and expertise. Uh, you can reach out to any one of us here through the CRE Breakfast Club. We're all on social media. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, Maxwell, Josh, Michael, uh, Steve, Andrew, Linda Day Harrison gets a huge shout out for me. Harry Klein, uh, everybody, we really appreciate you coming on here. Look forward to the next one uh, in another 30 days here. And uh, have a great afternoon and a super Tuesday, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Matt. Appreciate it.